Hi, everybody. My name is Curtis Mitch, and I'm with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. And welcome back to another weekday reflection on the daily Mass reading. Today is a beautiful Monday, April 12th, and today's gospel comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Now, what's going on in today's gospel? Today we have a nighttime conversation between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. And throughout this conversation, Jesus is trying to lift the mind of Nicodemus, right, from the flesh, the level of the flesh, to the level of the spirit. He's trying to keep him from just thinking in earthly terms and to begin thinking in heavenly terms, all right, or to, or to not merely think in human terms, but to think of things divine. And so throughout this whole conversation, Jesus is directing Nicodemus's attention upwards to think about God's work in a new way. And there's sort of a progression in this dialogue, okay? It begins, as many conversations do in the Gospel of John, when Jesus encounters another individual who comes to him with questions, it begins with a misunderstanding, all right? Nicodemus is initially confused. And so the rest of the conversation consists of Jesus kind of clarifying, imparting a true understanding to overcome the individual's misunderstanding. And then at the end, at the end of this particular dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus, I think we would have to say it's sort of inconclusive, all right? Will Nicodemus accept what Jesus is saying? Will Nicodemus become a disciple? Well, it doesn't appear that he's ready for a full-fledged conversion at this point, but this is just an early point in the story. What What we would see if we were to read the Gospel of John all the way to the end, we would see that this Nicodemus basically does come to Jesus very gradually, but actually, so that when it's time for Jesus to die and he is crucified in, in Jerusalem, it is Nicodemus who helps Joseph of Arimathea to bury the body of Jesus. So Nicodemus will eventually become a disciple, but in this episode, he's just starting out on his journey. He's just curious about Jesus and he's trying to gather some information. So let's read the text. This is John 3, verses 1 to 8. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus during the night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know from where it comes or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So let's just kind of set the scene here first. Who is this individual that comes to Jesus in this clandestine way, under the cover of darkness, this Nicodemus? Who is he actually? Well, John tells us two things. One, that he is a Pharisee, and two, that he is a ruler of the Jews. If he's a Pharisee, he's a very religious man. He's committed to living out the law of Moses in his daily life. So he's very concerned with things like ritual purity and and ceremonial cleanliness and with following all of the stipulations that the Pharisees had built up around the law of Moses just to ensure that there would be no infractions of the law of Moses in daily Jewish life. But we're also told he's a ruler of the Jews, and that probably indicates that uh, that Nicodemus is 
a powerful man, part of an aristocratic family, and quite possibly Nicodemus actually sits on the Jewish high court, what is known as the Sanhedrin. That's the ruling body in, in Judea at this particular time in history. Now, the curious thing is that if you read through the Gospel of John beginning to end, you'll notice two things, that the Pharisees and the rulers of Judea are both opponents of Jesus. These are two groups in the gospel that are the most hostile to Jesus. And yet here comes this one Pharisee, this one ruler of the Jews, whose, whose interest has been piqued. He's coming to Jesus because he's curious, but he's coming to Jesus and in doing so, he's breaking ranks with the rest of the Pharisees and the rest of the rulers of the Jews, okay? He's taking a risk here by coming to Jesus during the night. And that's probably precisely why he's coming to Jesus during the night. Because during the night, there's the practical value is that he's doing something dangerous, and this is the safest way to do it. He's intrigued by Jesus, and so he wants to dialogue with him, but he's not yet invested. He's not yet ready to take that full step of faith and say, Jesus, you are the Messiah that God is sending our people. But if this conversation that takes place during the night, if there's the practical side is that he's doing this because it's dangerous, there's also a symbolic side to that little detail that we read about there in verse 2. Why is it symbolic that this is happening during the night? Because it shows us that Nicodemus is still in the darkness of unbelief, okay? He's coming to Jesus for enlightenment, but he doesn't yet see clearly. And that kind of emerges uh, nicely as this dialogue unfolds. Nicodemus doesn't quite see. It's as though he's, he's in the dark about spiritual things um, just as much as he's in the dark talking to the shadowy figure of Jesus in the night. So what does Jesus say to him? How does Jesus respond to um, Nicodemus? Well, he sets before him the conditions for entering the kingdom of God, the condition for seeing the kingdom of God, and then the condition for entering the kingdom of God. And that happens in two verses, and that's what I'd like to kind of focus our attention on. Two verses. One is verse 3, the other is verse 5. In verse 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what does it mean to be born anew? Well, this little word here that's translated anu is anothen in Greek, and it can have different meanings. In fact, there's sort of a play on words going on here in this particular passage, because this word anothen can mean again or a second time. But it also has another well-attested meaning, and that's the meaning from above. All right. If you think about the gospel narratives, you know the story of when Jesus dies on the cross, the curtain or the veil in the temple is torn from top to bottom, from the top down. It's torn anothen, all right, from the, pop, from the top down to the bottom. So it's from above is the, this other sense. Now, Nicodemus understands it in the first way. He understands Jesus to be saying you have to be born again or you have to be born a second time. And so he kind of pushes a little bit and says, Jesus, you don't mean to say that you could crawl back into your mother's womb and be born a second time, do you? And of course, that's not what Jesus means. So Jesus then shifts to show him that what he means by anothen is not to be born a second time. What he means is that you have to be born from above. You have to be born from heaven. You have to be born from God. Okay, and that brings us to verse 5. How is this done? What does it mean to be born from above? Jesus explains. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So being born from above means being born of water and spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, we are very fortunate as Catholics. You probably know that the church has sort of authoritatively defined the meaning of very few passages in sacred scripture. Only a handful of them, as a matter of fact. But this verse here, John chapter 3, verse 5, just happens to be one of them. 
At the Council of Trent in the 16th century, the church said authoritatively that when Jesus speaks of water and the Spirit, he doesn't mean water metaphorically. He means water sacramentally. In other words, Jesus in John 3, 5 is talking about baptism. All right, and that's an important thing to clear up here because there are lots of different interpretations if you've ever discussed this or heard about this from other Christians or evangelists or what have you. They will often interpret water and spirit as something other than baptism. So for example, you will sometimes hear that when Jesus says you gotta be born of water and the spirit, he means, well, you have to be born physically and then you have to be born spiritually. And so water sort of corresponds to natural birth, right? Because when mom's water breaks, it's time to have a baby, right? It's the amniotic fluid. That's what Jesus is talking about. At least that's a popular interpretation. There are some others who would say, no, what Jesus means is you have to be baptized with the baptism of John the Baptist first, and then you have to be baptized by the Spirit, by the Messiah. Well, that's not what Jesus means either. You see, spirit and water actually go together, all right? And that's what the church is trying to tell us when it says that Jesus is talking about baptism. The water is a sign of the working of the spirit. And so water and spirit actually go together to form this one new birth, the birth from above that Jesus was talking about. Now, we can actually see this by looking closely at the Gospel of John. That interpretation is confirmed as, as fully reasonable and compelling when you look at this passage in its context. So, for example, back in John chapter 1, we saw the baptism of Jesus. And what happened at the baptism of Jesus? We had a coincidence of Jesus in the water receiving the Spirit. And the Spirit was coming down from above. And so water, spirit, from above, these things are triangulated. Jesus is talking about baptism. Likewise, the only time in the Gospel of John when Jesus speaks explicitly about baptism or we actually see him or his disciples engaging in a ministry of baptism, the only time we ever see that is right after the conversation with Nicodemus in verse 22. John says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea, <clears throat> and there he remained with them and baptized. John also was baptizing near Anon and Selim, because there was much water there, and people came and were baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. So right after this conversation with Nicodemus and this discussion of, of the need to be born of water and spirit, we see Jesus taking his disciples out to the Jordan River and doing a little bit of on-the-job training. He's showing them how to baptize. All right. Another thing we would point out is that water is closely associated with the Spirit. Water is a sign of the Spirit in John's Gospel in a way that's, that's clearer than even in the other Gospels. So just to look at one passage in John chapter 7, Here's Jesus standing up in the midst of a, a Jewish feast called the Festival of Tabernacles. And here's what he says. He says, he who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus sees the spirit the image of the Spirit is an image of living water, flowing water, water that gushes forth from him. So water here is not natural birth. Water here is not John's baptism. Water here is Christian baptism. It's the baptism that confers the Holy Spirit. And just to add one more last little thing to kind of cap this off, there's the closest association between water and the Spirit in the Old Testament, in the prophetic texts that kind of prepare the way for baptism in a Christian context, we see the same kind of association between water and spirit. I'll just read one passage. There are several, but I'll read one from Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 44 in verse 3. Isaiah says, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Yeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground, I will pour my spirit 
upon your descendants. So the image of pouring water on a thirsty ground is the same way of saying, according to the prophet, it's it's a metaphorical way of saying that he's going to pour out the spirit upon his people. And so water is an image of God's pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So all of this sort of confirms for us that Jesus in John 3, 5 is talking about baptism. Now, how are you and I to respond to this, this teaching about a sacrament that Jesus holds up to Nicodemus, who's still confused and still stumbling about in the dark? Well, there are two things. One, we can thank God for the gift of baptism. Because if you really take seriously what Jesus is saying, you realize that baptism is the thing that gives us entrance into the kingdom of God. We cannot be, we would not be sons and daughters of God apart from the saving waters of baptism. It is the sacrament of faith, but it is the sacrament of regeneration, the sacrament that saves us from all of our sins, that saves us from original sin, and makes us members of the family of God. So we should be thankful for the gift of baptism. But we can also thank God for the gift of the church, that the church can give us her authoritative guidance, her excess of light. She can shine on the sacred scriptures and give us a clear sense of assurance about what it means and sometimes what it doesn't mean. And so we can be thankful both for the sacrament of baptism and for the church showing us here, this passage in scripture is precisely about the sacrament of baptism. That's what Jesus is talking about, to be born of water and spirit and to enter the kingdom of God in that way, that means you have to be baptized. Now, I hope all of this was at least of some benefit to you. I pray that God blesses you, your family, and your day, and I look forward to seeing you here again next time. Thanks.